What is the most random argument you've ever ended up in? Every field has a type of argument you get into on occasion that to anyone who's not part of that field, it just sounds like crazy. Right? I asked some friends, what is the most random argument, like serious argument you've ended up in? And it was fascinating to hear the stories. I heard uh, a chemist telling me about uh, if you can, if they know it's safe to store a chemical at negative 20 degrees, can they store it safely at negative 70? That, that's a rather serious question if you're looking at the stability of a chemical structure. I, I was hearing about um, if, you're, if you are importing tomatoes, do you pay the tariff as if the tomatoes are a fruit or a vegetable? It's different. It, you'll be glad to know that the United States government has declared for, forthwith and from henceforth that the tomato is a vegetable and not a fruit. Biology be darned, they pay you pay tariff like it's a vegetable. So there's, there's that answer. A friend of mine runs a soup kitchen in Kansas City, and, and they, a, a, a question they had to ask, can you get seconds at a soup kitchen? The whole point of it is to give food to people who don't have food, and, and can they get seconds? And what do you do with leftovers at a soup kitchen? Do you give them away? Like, well, how do you, how do you, what do you do there? But there, you start getting into the questions. I, I had a whole list of these great questions. I asked Facebook, so I have this whole list of questions. Like, where, when was Beowulf composed? What is the difference between fiction and nonfiction? There are always these great questions in the fields that really, if you start listening, you'd never expect this question to be asked. It, it's so obtuse. I'm going to introduce you to a question that is as obtuse as they get, and I'm going to ask, so the next minute could be potentially very boring. If you can stay awake for the next minute, I promise it's worth it, but I'm going to tell you about one of the most obtuse arguments that you'll have heard of in a, quite a while. You see, in 1951, this fellow by the last name of Niebuhr wrote a book called Christ and Culture. And it is a book that I'm willing to, I would be willing to bet at least one paycheck on that every preacher you've ever had in that pulpit has read. It's one of those books that if you are trained as a preacher since that time, you have read that book, you have argued about that book, you have been shaped by that book. And what that book does is it lays out the options for how Christ relates to culture. It's right there in the title, right? And so, to give you the, the very short Cliff Notes version of the book, here's how it goes. It, one option is that you have Christ against culture. That the job of the church, as people gathered around Christ, is to tell the culture to be against culture, because culture is just so messed up and, and doomed and, and, and in such a mess that the job of the church is to look at culture and just yell at it. Y'all, Yo, you are just messed up! Ah, right? Just If you yell enough at the culture, maybe it will hear you and understand how broken and messed up it is. We've heard that before, haven't we? Another option for uh, this is Christ uh, of culture. This is sort of hippies, right? It's written in 1951, but it sort of anticipates this idea that you just, you go out into the world and wherever there is love, you'll find Jesus. Just go find people loving in each other, and that's where you'll find Christ, right? Just, just flower children, that, that sort of theory of church. Another was sort of Christ above church, or Christ above culture, that the church uh, is supposed to be above culture, that, that the world is doomed, and we're up here, and we're saved, so we're just going to be up here, and okay, we're just up here saved, doing our thing, and and whatever. And then the final, you ever notice how the last thing on the list is always what the author wants you to believe in? The last thing on this list is Christ transforming culture. That the task of the church is to go into culture and transform it and make it a better place, improve the world. And that is, everyone who reads this book, including myself, I would show you my copy of the book, but it's still packed. I really am going to finish unpacking one of these days. But uh, my I would show you this book. When I read this book, you get to the last option, Christ transforming culture, and you go, yes, that's it. Right? We need to go into the world and tr change it for the better and that is the first task of the church. Go out and change the world. The problem is, well, after two or three generations of, of preachers being trained like this, let me ask you the Dr. Phil question. How's that going? 
Right? When you go out into the culture, is the culture a more peaceful, respectful, honest, graceful culture than it was in 1951? How, how are we doing on that? Right? If, the, if the theory of the church has been that the task of the church is to begin by going out and changing the world, that's the first thing we do. i got to tell you, I don't think the culture has really responded all that well. There's some, there's some obvious positive uh, uh, movement since 1951, but I think we could agree that our culture has gotten just a touch crass. So, let me begin, let me explain what I think might be the first task of the church. And I want us to begin by looking at scripture, which is always a good place to begin. Let's start looking at scripture. We, and not just looking at one or two verses of scripture. You can prove anything if you take two verses of scripture. I want to look at big chunks of scripture. If you read big chunks of scripture and you look for the things that come up again and again, what comes up again and again? Have you ever noticed how if you just listen to someone long enough, you're going to hear what's really in their heart? The gracious person will eventually sound gracious. The person who is a, a curmudgeon, it will eventually, that just shines on through, doesn't it? Right? If you listen to what God has to say, reading these big old chunks of Scripture, you will hear what is upon God's heart, what God cares about. And one of the things you hear again and again is how much God wants to gather His people together. Psalm 107 is a call to worship, and we hear that God wants to gather the, those, His people from the east, the west, the north, and south. That that's, happens multiple times in the Psalms. If you go back to the beginning of Exodus, when Moses shows up and he's going to do his thing in Egypt, what is, what's the first thing he does in Egypt? He gathers the elders together, or the elders of the 12 tribes, and says, here's what's going to happen. Here's God's plan. First, let's get everyone together. If you read through the prophets, I'm going to use Isaiah. It, this holds for the other prophets as well. But throughout the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 11, God will gather the dispersed people of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Isaiah 40, God will gather as a shepherd gathers lambs. Isaiah 54, if you think you are forsaken, God is still coming to gather you with great compassion. Isaiah 66, there is a time coming when God will gather all of the nations. Jesus continues to, to preach this. When Jesus looks down upon Jerusalem, what does he say about Jerusalem? It's in Luke, uh, Luke 13. Jesus talks about wanting to gather you as a, as a mother hen gathers her chicks. If you go to the end of the, book, of the Bible in Revelation, Revelation 7, there's a final gathering of all, every nation and tribe beyond counting. Based upon my understanding of Scripture, not just one or two places, but the entirety of, of the Bible, the first thing that God wants to do with people is get them all in the same place. Gather them. I believe that the first task of the church before anything else is to be the church. Now that might sound a little bit simple, a little bit, a little bit tautological, but it, I believe it to be profoundly true. The first task of the church is to be certain that it is gathered as the church. And if you want the example of how this gets argued about, I gave you the quote. This is one of my, one of my professors in seminary. Whenever I read this, I hear it in a high nasal Texas twang as he get up. Dr. Howross would get up there and say, "The church is constituted as a new people who have been gathered from the nations to remind the world that the church is not the world." Oh man, he was a fun guy, but that was uh, blunt. He had this. Yeah, you'll hear more stories about him down the road. And you take. All of that long quote and I'll boil it down to you to make it real simple. The church needs to be the church before anything else. Be the church. That is the first task. If you look at your bulletin, flip it open, you'll find that there are four things we do every Sunday. They're the, they're the headings in bold. Pro gathering, proclamation, uh, response, and sending forth. Right? And if you feel like that might be your next couple Sundays of sermons, you might be on to something. But uh, the first thing we have to do is gather. But before we do anything else, we have to make sure that we are gathered together. 
Now, to gather has two things going. First it is to leave something behind and then to be gathered around something we hold in common. When we gather around Jesus, gathering to be the church, what do we leave out there? Right? What do we leave at the doors? When you walk into this building, what we leave behind are the distinctions that we hold between city and suburban and rural, between college educated and those with a degree in the school of life, between different ethnicities, between low class, high class, middle class, between those who have plenty to, uh, who have plenty saved up and those who are just living week to week. All the ways that we keep score, and that's what it is, right? All the ways that we keep score between people, that all stays out there. We come in here and what is most important is we are gathered around Jesus. And so we leave the fear and the worry and the concern and the score keeping out there. Let the world do that. In here, we are gathered around Jesus. And in here, everyone is equally welcome. In here, there's always enough at that table. In here, we practice abundance and hope and purpose and forgiveness. We are gathered to proclaim that we are the church and the church is greater than any nation or any, any one place. We are bound together with all the churches gathered around the world. This gathering, I believe, it is essential because I don't think you can be Christian if you're not gathered. Now, that might be a strong statement, but let me point something out. Did Jesus ever have just a disciple? Singular, right? Jesus always had disciples. Plural. Right? Jesus always did, thing with mul did things with multiple disciples. When, when Jesus sends out his disciples, he could have sent them in 12 different directions. Is that what he does? No, he sends them out two by two by two. Could have covered a lot more ground sending out 12 in 12 directions. Nope, two by two. And G Jesus sends out the disciples twice, sends them two by two. Jesus sends out 70 disciples later. How does he send them out? Two by two. Jesus goes up the mountain for the transfiguration. How many disciples does he bring? Three. I cannot think of a time when, when Jesus has a single disciple. Jesus is always doing things with multiple disciples gathered. To follow Jesus is a team sport. There's no such thing as being solo and following Jesus. The greatest commandments are, are what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You gotta have someone to love. You, if you don't have, if you're not gathered with your neighbor, you've got no one to love on. You cannot follow Jesus alone. You gotta have a neighbor to love on. You gotta have disciples to gather with. I believe as we read what Jesus says and does, we see that there's no such thing as being Christian alone. You need each other. I need each other. I want you to, don't look at me right now, look at each other. I want you to make eye contact with a bunch of people. Eye contact, right? The most important thing about being gathered today is not that you're gathered in front of me, but you're gathered with each other. You need each other. You can't be Christian alone. I can't be Christian without you. The first task of the church is not to go out and to change the world. The first task of the church is, be to, is to be together, to be gathered away from what is broken and, and to be gathered in a way that begins to be our response. If you want a response to poverty in the world, I don't have a response to poverty as the church. What is the church's response to poverty? Well, the church is the response, because in here there's enough. If you, there's a person in poverty, my response is come gather and be part of this church. There's enough when we're gathered here. Right? If you want a response to violence and war, the church doesn't have a response to violence and war. The church is the response to violence and war. We gather together and we follow the Prince of Peace. That's our response, is to gather. We gather as a church, and that is our response to, to lying as we come here and we confess and we tell the truth. Our response to brokenness and shattered families is to come here and to forgive each other and to pass the peace. Right? To gather is our response to the brokenness of the world. To leave that out there and come here and be something different. You've heard that 90% of life is just showing up, and that, 
It's the case with this, just as much as anything. The first task of the church is to show up in the name of Jesus, to be the people gathered together, and if there ever was a sermon in which I was preaching to the choir, this is it, right? I'm saying it's important to show up, and y'all, what did y'all do today? You showed up. Good job, right? Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for gathering for worship. And I began this sermon with some very esoteric and random questions and facts. I want to end with a very esoteric and random one. You are gathered to worship. But the word worship actually has an earlier pronunciation. Worship dropped two letters along the way. There was a TH in there. It used to be worth-ship. Right? Worth-ship. You can understand why the, th why the TH got dropped. It's kind of awkward to say. is an English great. But worth-ship. To worth-ship is to be gathered around something that you decide is worthy. Think about all the times you worth-ship during the week. When y'all got together Friday night, I hear it was a good game. That was an act. Well, it was a good game. We, what was the scores? Yeah, 64. There's a good in a certain sense. But uh, you, that was an act of worth-ship. That was worth your time. I did a different act of worth-ship during that time. I hung out with my family, right? That was my act of worth-ship. I'll be at some games, but man, I feel bad leaving Olivia in the... Yeah, we're, we're going to work on that so we can take the whole family. Right? We make these decisions throughout the week. I think this is the act, that, the biggest act of worth we make. This time is worth it. It is worth it because you have decided that Jesus is worthy of giving up your, your morning and to offering it to something greater. And I appreciate that and I thank you. You have succeeded at the first task of the church. You got to get together and be church. Amen.